historic day. Yes, the Federal Reserve just completing the first regularly scheduled press conference. Now, Eric Schoenberg, editor-in-chief, MoneyWatch.com, uh, you don't usually see a Fed chair speaking to a room full of reporters unless something really bad has happened in the financial markets. Why did he do it today? And we're going to translate what he said. I should also do the introductions because I'm here with both Eric and Jack Otter from MoneyWatch and Mark Toma, the, um, who's got the longest title in the world. I'm just going to say super-duper economist out in Oregon, and you're wearing a tie, even though you're from Oregon, which is weird. Well, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, you're going to also help us translate what exactly the Fed said, not only in its statement, but what Bernanke was talking about. Uh, because somehow or other, Eric, they, you need a decoder ring when yeah. you're actually watching these things. Whenever a, a Fed chairman opens his mouth, yeah, you do need a decoder ring. I thought he tried pretty hard to keep it in plain English. and. Uh, uh, and the press also tried pretty hard to keep the questions in plain English, so it wasn't too technical. But the Fed has a PR problem. Uh, it is as unpopular as that institution has ever been, and hopefully seeing more of the bearded one will make us feel more kindly towards the Fed. I don't know. Mark, do you think that the, the Fed chairman said anything interesting or noteworthy, except the breaking news, which was the Fed can't do anything about gas prices? <laughs> I thought that was a big one. Yeah, that's something he said before. I really didn't think he said anything new at all. I think it was all in the FOMC statement, if you said it. And I think he was just trying to explain to Main Street a little better exactly what the Fed's thinking. But I really didn't get any surprises out of the conference. That's good because it won't cause the financial market volatility he talked about. So I think he was successful in that way. But but no, no surprises. I think that was their intent. Yeah. And, and uh, Jack, do you think that he actually answered that question about unemployment? I sort of felt like at the time when someone finally said, what about jobs? He basically was like, yeah, we don't we can't do a lot about long term <laughs> unemployment. Is that is that effectively what he said? Uh, yes. And it's true. I, I think that the, the premise of that question was actually maybe the most important point made in the entire press conference, which was that the Fed can only do so much. Really, the Fed and frankly, all government can do is is kind of keep us off of the precipice. So I think the stimulus spending at first was pretty good because it prevented the markets from going to free fall. It, it gave us confidence that the government was there. But really, the, the, the Fed can't suddenly magically take us down to 5% unemployment. Um, as far as gas prices, they actually could do something there. They could dramatically spike the value of the dollar, which would bring gas prices down for us. And and nail us in all other kinds of ways. And but when he asked, when he was trying to talk about the dollar, that that lovely French gentleman who was serving croissant to everybody uh, just minutes before the presser started. No, no, no stereotypes. Uh, uh, I like croissants. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Uh, now, what he starts to ask about the value of the dollar. What is the answer to that? I mean, we've got a. I'm going to just pull up a chart while you talk about this, Eric. Hold on a second. I got to do that. Where I would see that. Is that look at that, uh, Mark? We've got a chart that looks like the other, that like the downside of Everest about the value of the dollar. Just to give you the visual here, um, and the dollar has actually fallen eight percent since Bernanke first started talking about quantitative easing to back at the end of August of last year. So, what is the answer to this? Like, hey, what about the value of the dollar? Did you think he responded to that? Uh, well, I think that he has uh, uh, as an uh, trying. Guy, uh, the guy trying to get the economy to recover, he wants to see the dollar fall. It means that our exports will pick up. It's kind of uh, unfair, and and of course, it's something he never wants to admit. So he quoted uh, Secretary Geithner in saying, "You know, strong dollars in everyone's best interest, unless you happen to be an exporter or right, a John Fed Deere. chairman." Right, John Deere <laughs> yes, doesn't think right. so. We're happy with that low dollar. So uh, you know, I you can sort of say that that uh, uh, may be one of the unwritten goals of the Fed in its monetary policy, get the dollar down and get exports up, get people out of savings and into the stock market. It certainly had that effect anyway. Mark, what, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say, what I think is really powerful about this chart, though, is the fact that the major decline in the dollar was between 2000 and 2008. And ever since then, we're still in a range. We're actually a little above the point where we were in, in 2008. So this recent hysteria is, is kind of silly. Now, if we should break down through that and keep on going down, that would be something to worry about. But right now, we're, we're just trading in a range. Mark, should American people care about a falling dollar? I mean, who cares if you're not traveling to, like, you know, if you're not going abroad? Do you care? You shouldn't. I mean, well, you should care in the sense that a falling dollar will do exactly what Eric said it will do. It'll increase our exports and decrease our imports and help our economy. So in that sense, yeah, it's great. 
I mean, if you're Walmart, you're not going to be very happy about it because you're a major importer and that's going to make things harder for you and you're going to work against that. So the, it depends on whose interest you're talking about. But overall, for the public in general, a falling dollar isn't a big deal. And Mark, just, and, so, and Mark do you think that, that like regular people who are going to see a soundbite tonight or read about this tomorrow morning in their local newspapers, they really only care about like why doesn't anyone care in this federal government about my gas prices? And what's the answer to them? Why? How can how can I, you know, you, we respond to people who say, what do you mean there's no inflation? My food costs more, my gas costs more. What can we tell them definitively that they can really understand from the, at least from the Fed's perspective about inflation? If the Fed caused the problem, then the Fed can do something about it. If the Fed didn't cause the problem, they're going to have much more mm. difficult time doing something about it. It's the Fed's view, and this is a debate across the world among central banks, developing countries are upset. It's the Fed's view that they didn't cause the problem, they think it's going to be temporary, they, they think it will abate over time, and that they can't do anything about it. And so the Fed's message to the public is you're going to have to live with it because we can't do anything about it except make things worse by, by trying to fight inflation by raising interest rates. And that's not a very comforting message to the general public, but I, I, I really think that's about all they can say at this point. And do you think that the Fed is causing inflation right now? Ooh, did we lose him or for a second? I'm, we're, we're here. Yes, okay. we had a temporary little loss there. Okay. Um, so do you think the Fed is contributing to inflation right now, Mark? No, I don't. And I think... Um, I think they actually should at least explain why they're not going to do a QE3. If you look at their core inflation projections for 2011, 2012, 2013 they put out, they're from 1.1 to 2 percent. Nobody on the Fed seems to think that's the range of, of the forecast, that they're even going to exceed their target when it comes to core inflation. They have the commodity price problem they think is going to abate. So the question is, if you're not worried about inflation, and he spent a lot of time telling us he's not worried about inflation, you've got a dual mandate, you're below your long-run inflation target, you've got an unemployment problem, why is it that you aren't going to do more? Now, he says, well, I'm, a I'm afraid of the, the inflation fairies in the future coming along and they're going to do something bad, they're going to create these inflation problems, but we're not seeing those. And so why not do more now? And I think that's the question the public has. If you buy into the fact that, that inflation is a very bad thing and it's something they should fear, then I think the Fed's doing the right thing. I tend to think that there's room for more easing. Yeah. Well, and, and Jack, do you think that's going to happen? Uh, it doesn't sound <laughs> like it. Not from what he said today. Not at all. No. No, I, I don't think I don't think there's any shot at QE three at three. I mean, it seems almost impossible to imagine that he could do it. Although the one thing I thought that was interesting that he did say was, "You and Congress cut too much out of the budget, then we will get easier. We will correct any short term." what they think I think is a mistake in terms on the spending side. So that was the one thing I did think he was sort of smacking down uh, politicians <laughs> a little bit. What do you think, yeah, Eric? Yeah, so I think that was very interesting. But uh, I think that, that Mark raises a good question. If inflation is, inflation was the break on monetary policy, the reason that he's not doing more to, to fight uh, unemployment. If really he doesn't think inflation is a problem and not in the near term and not in the, or at least not in the medium term, then why isn't he doing more about unemployment? I think, uh, in addition to the question that you raised, Jill, about you know why people are mo mainly worried about gas prices, I think they're also very worried about unemployment. That his long-range projection, 2016, 2014, I think it was, of uh, unemployment down to 7.2 percent, that's not very encouraging. Yeah. Mark, and, and if you think about it, I'd much rather pay five bucks for a gallon and have a job than two fifty a gallon and not have a job. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, he did have, make an interesting point there that supply and demand is the factor here with gas. And we know people are already driving a little bit less. They're taking a few steps. With any luck, it will be a self-correcting problem. Mark, you economists always go back. You know, it's just supply and demand, <laughs> and you make us remember like why we should have actually paid more attention in Econ 101. Isn't that right? Yeah, most of it's supply and demand. Sometimes there's a bubble, right. <laughs> which means you're well, not. Well, I'm glad you brought up bubbles for a second because uh, I I noticed that he did say something about this was caused by the housing bubble, but he didn't go into the and we helped blow up that bubble because yes. of our policy. So, is it fair to say that the Fed had some hand in creating that bubble and therefore it should that is something they can correct? In order to get a bubble, you need to have something to blow up that bubble, and then it needs to pop. And so I think that a combination of the savings glut that Bernanke's talked about 
and the Fed's low interest rate policy work together to create the liquidity that was needed to, to fuel the bubble. Now, you, you might have had baffles in a way that stopped that liquidity from actually blowing up that balloon, but those were absent. So it wasn't the interest rate alone, but it was certainly a part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Is there another bubble forming in some other markets? Um, can we look at the silver market and say, wow, those dudes down on COMEX and NYMEX are blowing up a bubble there, or is this, or is this much ado about nothing? To the extent that their fears about inflation are unfounded, which is driving a lot of the gold price, then I think you could rightly call this a bubble. If sometime in the future those inflation fears aren't realized, those prices are going to crash. Um, so in my perspective, it is a bit of a bubble for exactly that reason. Thomas short in the metals right now. Uh -huh. I just heard him say it. He said it right here, clear as a bell. Um, what else can the American public, Eric, take from this, the, you know, this, this pageant of press conferences. What, what should we care? Why should anyone care about this? I mean, we got to get ready for the royal wedding. <laughs> we do. We do. Yeah. First things first. Uh, I think the, the message they ought to take away is that the Fed can't solve all their problems, that it's going to be a slow climb back up. Um, and uh, I hope that people take some heart in Ben's continued uh, assurances that inflation is under control. I, I, I hope he's right. I, I'm encouraged that Mark thinks he is. Uh, and Otherwise, you know, I think we're just going to have to stick it out, tighten our belts. And and Jack, do you want to comment on the fashion? Um, <laughs> do you want to say something about his red tie? I noticed that Mark's also wearing a red tie. As so, is Eric. At, so, well, his isn't red red. His is more of like a muted, richer, um, you know, like burgundy. Yes. I, when you become a real economist, you get to wear the red red. Is that yeah. right? Now, is this, was this, <laughs> exactly. So um, <laughs> there's going to have to suffer through this three times. I really feel like I need a double espresso right now. I'm not kidding. But like, there's, is this, is this going to be helpful really to anybody except us? I mean, it's fun for us to watch it. And it's fun for, I think, for journalists to be able to ask these questions directly. It's neat. But why should anyone in America really care about this? Come on. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I'll take a stab at it and say he said his quotes on the deficit were, this is of the highest importance. It's the biggest long-term financial problem facing this country. Now, it's not as if that's breaking news, but it's nice to hear that guy say it, but also say let's not be too rash in our approach to solving that problem. I mean, to me, those are the kind of two points you got to hit. One, yeah, it's a really big problem. Two, you don't just suddenly slash and burn and turn into Ireland. Oh, and Mark, is there any, are there parting words that you want to give to regular people? Why do they need to care about the Fed and what the Fed is saying? What is it that you want them to take away? I think the message the Fed was trying to say today is we care so much about you, we're willing to risk volatility and try to explain our actions to you. And so they're really trying to, it's not what they say, it's the fact that they're doing it at all that, that, that's really the message for the public. And they're trying to send the message that we really do care about employment, our hands are tied, we've got deficit problems, oil price problems, all sorts of other things, but boy, we, we care. I think that's the message. I don't, I don't know if people believe them. But that, that's what they're trying to say. Do you think it's a good idea that they do these press conferences or not? I think it is. I, I think it is part of this ongoing transparency that we've seen for the last 20 years. And I, I think we'll see further moves. I don't think we'll ever have cameras in the deliberations inside the meetings. That'd be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is part of a long process and we shouldn't make too much of it on its own. So you, if the Fed had a Facebook page, you would be a fan is what you're saying? Yeah, probably so. All right. And Eric, Doesn't the Fed have a Facebook page? I'm they sure they do. One. I'm sure they do. They have a beautiful website. Um, and, and Eric, just before we go, um, in, in terms of looking forward at, you know, kind of that we're, we're coming to an inflection point. I mean, clearly interest rates are going to be shifting, even if the Fed just sort of takes their, the foot off the pedal and stops QE2 and stops reinvesting some of the proceeds. And all, What should regular people at home be thinking about in the next six months as interest rate policy starts to change? They should be thinking about saving more money. That's the, that's the biggest thing that could have gotten them through the crisis and the biggest thing that can take care of their financial security. That hasn't changed no matter what the Fed's policy is. And they'll be rewarded now for saving more. For that's finally. right. If interest rates go up, yes, they right? finally get a payback. You're right. I, and, and Jack, you have a, a parting word for like what, what interest well, rates are going to change. <laughs> They're, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but things are going to be shifting. Uh, on this point, I guess I, I wouldn't be too firm in your conviction of exactly how it's going to shift. So... You know, if you threw all your money in gold, I'd pull back a little on that trade. But I also wouldn't leave all your money in the bank twiddling your thumbs until you get a whopping, what, 1.8% on your money. Uh, it, it, we say it all the time, but boy, diversify. Uh, a lot of things look overvalued right now, except perhaps 
houses. <laughs> yeah, right. Mark, is there any is there anything that you think in terms of like how people can be preparing for the change in interest rate policy, what they should be thinking about today? Well, the message the Fed wants to say is if interest rates go up, it's good news because it means economic growth has increased and what people should do in that sort of case is you know not be in, in variable rate mortgages and all those sorts of things as interest rates go up. If interest rates go up for some other reason, like foreign countries decide we're not such a good credit risk after all and stop lending us money, then I think people need to take much more cautionary types of action. So it really depends upon what's driving those interest rates up. My hope and my best guess is it will be because growth increases. So let's hope that's what happens. Okay, wait a second. Yeah. We, found, we found an optimistic economist. We finally <laughs> found one. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. And Eric and Jack, I think we should do this more often when, when we have press conferences at least. And maybe if we, I think we should live blog the economic impact of the royal wedding. I mean, that's, it's <laughs> Trending. We could get there. Uh, I'm with you, Jill. I'm with you. Get in on the conversation. Mark, thanks so much. Eric Thank Schoenberg you. and Jack Otter, um, great to be with you guys. And thanks for watching MoneyWatch.com. We'll have lots of commentary on what's going on with the Fed, the Fed decision, and this exciting first in a 97-year history uh, Money Watch history right there made. Yeah, I don't even right. know what, I just heard my own voice in the in my headphones, but it was exciting. Anyway, thanks for watching. Go to moneywatch.com for more commentary, analysis, and our views from people like Eric and Mark and uh, everyone else here at moneywatch.com. So thanks very much. There, <laughs> there it is. Yeah. I was like, wow, there Wait it is. <laughs>